Oh, welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us um, on behalf of the Studies in Sports Media series at University of Illinois Press. It's my privilege to introduce Jen McLaren on the launch of her exceptional Fighting Visibility, Sports Media and Female Athletes in the UFC. Woohoo! So my name is Victoria Johnson and with Travis Bogan, I'm a co-editor of the Studies in Sports Media series, which publishes titles featuring humanities-based research that explores and critiques sports media's significance, uses, and power, bridging the gap between media studies and sports studies by paying attention to sports history, politics, and particularities, while probing the industrial, political, commercial, and aesthetic context that shape media's production, circulation, and consumption. Books in the series make important scholarly interventions while also exhibiting the clarity, accessibility, liveliness, and topicality that non-academic audiences also expect. Jen's Fighting Visibility is an absolutely stellar example of such work and a real flagship for the series with its close examination of the history and industrial practices of the UFC, focused particularly through analysis of the promotion's use of branded difference and dependence upon its female athletes' visibility as an athletic and economic imperative. But none of you are here to listen to me. So I'd like to introduce our speakers today so we can get right to it. Uh, Jennifer McLaren is a feminist media scholar whose research examines the representation and production of difference in popular media with a specific interest in sports and consumer culture. She probes the ways networked sports media circulate discourses of gender, race, sexuality, and nationality through the lenses of feminist theory, cultural studies, and humanistic media studies. Dr. McLaren is Assistant Professor of Media Studies in the Department of Radio, Television, Film at the University of Texas at Austin, where she is also affiliated faculty with the Center for Sports Communication and Media and the Center for Entertainment and Media Industries. And we're also incredibly fortunate to have Julie Kedzie join Jen in conversation today. Julie is a graduate of the University of Iowa's nonfiction writing MFA program, who is working on a memoir about her experiences as a professional mixed martial arts fighter. She's currently an analyst and color commentator for Invicta Fighting Championships and also just started a new job as an editor. Which, um, so the plan for today is that Jen and Julie will chat for about 40 minutes and then there'll be time for Q&A. So drop your questions in the chat. Um, and I'm also going to drop Jen and Julie's Twitter handles in the chat so you can be sure to follow up uh, and follow up with them after the event. Um, and finally, a little birdie, not the Twitter kind, told me that today is Julie's birthday. So we should all join in to serenade her as well. Thank you, Vicki. And thank you, Julie. I'm so excited for this conversation today. When I first started re researching this book back in uh, 2014, everybody I talked to said, when I started asking the particular questions that I was asking about the UFC, everyone said, you have to talk to Julie Kessie. <laughs> and it took a few years, but eventually I was able to, and I realized what all the hype was about. So <laughs> thank you so much uh, for joining me today. And thank you to Vicki and to Travis for you, all the work that they did to help me turn this into the book that it is. And I'm really excited to, to have this conversation. So thanks to them and thanks, Julie. So Julie, what I thought we would start with is I will, I'll just sort of talk about how I came to this book. And then I was hoping that you could introduce yourself by talking about how you came to MMA, what it was like in sort of the pre-UFC years, when you were first getting started, because that was a very particular time period with very particular challenges for, for female athletes. And then what, what your experience was, you know, briefly um, once you, you came into the UFC. So I'll start. The way I came to this is kind of, I didn't expect. I, I started grad school and I had been training martial arts for several years. And I had Brazilian jiu-jitsu jiu training partners that really liked watching UFC. And I kind of had bought into the stereotype that it's this hyper-masculine blood sport. And that, you know, as a, I had you know, a background in more traditional martial arts. And so we sort of turned up our nose at it and said, oh, this is just, you know, this is just unbridled violence. 
Uh, and I started watching with some friends and I thought, oh, well, this is a little bit more interesting than I thought. There's way more technique and, you know, it's actually a legitimate sport. And around that time is when Ronda Rousey got introduced to the UFC. And I thought very skeptically, oh, how are they going to do with this? It's an organization that John McCain was like, that's human cockfighting. Uh, and so it had this reputation and I thought, you know, this isn't going to be an organization that's really going to make inroads in terms of representing female athletes. And I got very curious how they were representing women, because um, in a lot of ways, they do some things that other sports are not doing in terms of how they're treating female athletes. And so that's how I initially got, got started with this project. But I'd love to hear from you, Julie, because you have a much longer history than I do and a much longer history outside of the UFC as well. Well, you know, it's interesting um, because it's fighting, you know, it's about visibility. I would say I was probably one of the least visible fighters <laughs> in the UFC during my time. I don't think a lot of people know that I fought in the UFC, um, but I was one of the more visible female fighters um, before that happened. And, you know, I did participate in 2007 in the first kind of broadcast TV um, female fight against Gina Carano. And uh, I was also, I guess there were other times when I got some visibility, you know, in terms of MMA, like I was on the tap out reality show and, and some other things that might seem a little bit niche right now, but at the time, you know, uh, it, it seemed like I was, somebody people asked questions about, you know, and they had questions about female fighters. Um, a lot of the times people would come to me and ask me. And, you know, that's a, it's a strange expertise to have, particularly because I was mostly famous for losing the big fight. <laughs> like, and it's like, you know, it's not, it's not a way of putting myself down. It's, you know, the honest truth, but it takes two people to fight. And, you know, it's interesting when you say, um, when you first encountered the UFC, you know, you kind of thought it was that hyper-violent masculine, you know, sort of, um, I guess, I don't know if stereotype is right because it is hyper-violent and masculine, mm -hmm. um, but it, not necessarily in the worst sort of way. And I'm sure we can expand on that later. Mm -hmm. um, but when I first watched the UFC, I thought it was very boring and I couldn't figure out why these, the first fight I saw was, I think it was a sh sh um, Ken Shamrock, Hoist Gracie rematch. And it was 25 minutes of grappling. And I was like, this is so boring. They're just fighting each other. I don't understand. I too came from a traditional martial arts background. Um, but to test for my third degree black belt in Taekwondo, I had to study other martial arts. And so um, I had studied some combat submission wrestling with Eric Paulson. He would come through Indiana to, to give seminars. I loved that. I loved Muay Thai kickboxing. And so in watching this fight, I was like, I just don't, this is so boring. And then a friend put on, um, an all-female show, Hook and Shoot Revolution, actually was the name of it, which is interesting that, you know, that promotional video for Rousey and Home is also a revolution. It's a mm -hmm. pretty all-encompassing word. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, and when I saw this, I saw women fighting, I was like, oh yeah, this is the violence I get. This is way more interesting than the men. Mm -hmm. And that was probably in 2002, 2001, 2002, something like that. Um, and it was really, it was really mind boggling me to kind of have purpose. I was like, no, I want to do that. I want to fight like them. I want to do this sport. And that's how I got into it. That's how I fell in love with it and really pursued it. And, you know, I, like I said, the inroads that I made in the sport, I had 29 professional fights. The last two were in the UFC and they were losses. The two before that were in Strike Force, and they were losses. And so it was just like, it was one of those things where it was just like, when I say famous for losing, I, I I don't think I'm a loser. I think I got a chance to fight professionally and it was incredible, but I also bring a perspective to the table that um, is maybe less influenced by what could happen next in my career as a fighter. You know, I'm done fighting. I've been done fighting for a while. And what you learn in your career, especially if you're more of a journeyman career, journey woman career as a fighter is how the sport looks on a whole, like on, on a larger level. And so that's, I guess that's a perspective I can bring to the table. Mm -hmm, definitely. And it's interesting that you say, <laughs> you describe yourself as a loser, because that's not how anybody else describes you. Everyone <laughs> else says, Julie Kedzie, MMA pioneer, hands down. So 
that's how we all remember you rather than how you remember yourself that way. <laughs> but I mean, it's really helpful. And, and, and that, you know, I kind of start the book in thinking about, you know, the fact that women were involved in MMA before the UFC decided that they were going to introduce women. And so there is a, this history before that's important to talk about, even though the, the major focus of the book, of course, is the UFC. And that's what I spend most of my time doing. But you know, there are there are plenty of women that were influential in the sport before before Ronda Rousey. So that's important to know. But she was, you know, in terms of UFC lore, I actually tried. I really tried to uncover a different story in terms of how women really got started in the UFC. Um, but you know, everyone I, I spoke to kind of pointed to her as 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 launching this because the UFC was like, never, 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 we're never going to include women. And then Rousey had some impressive fights in Strike Force, and they said, "Okay, we're you know we'll give it a, we'll give it a, a shot. It'll be a six month experiment, and maybe it'll work out." And they were shocked at the level of interest that she brought initially, and then the level of interest that fans have had since then in supporting female fighters and watching female fighters. And so that's the context of where I started with the book, but of course. What happens over you know, several years of research is you get interested in, in a certain thing. You know, and I started with the, the interest in representation of powerful women. And then it evolved into, okay, what do these images actually get us? And what happens and who benefits from these particular images? And the overall, the reason the book is called Fighting Visibility is, is that I take a look at what the UFC does right in terms of representation, in terms of promoting women and bringing women to the sport. And in a lot of ways, if you look at overall sports media coverage of female athletes is something like 4% of all global sports media coverage. So if you compare the UFC to that, they're actually doing really good. And even though all of that's true, the way the structure of the organization works is that because fighters are independent contractors, they, the UFC has a very expendable labor force. And this happens for men and for women. But what's happening in particular with female athletes is they have this level of visibility that they've never had in combat sports, but yet who's actually benefiting from that is the UFC. And I don't think it, the fighters are benefiting to the degree that they should. Mm -hmm. And so that's the really the arc of the book is, is, is to say, hey, let's, let's not be so celebratory of this idea of revolution or the idea of breaking barriers or representation, representation matters, or if she can see it, she can be it because what does that actually get these female fighters? And I argue that it actually gets them more avenues to be exploited. Mm -hmm. Anything that you would add um, that no, you saw like, coming through? I think you nailed it. I think one of the, um, the issues that, of course, I had coming into the UFC or in, in all of MMA is we are preconditioned to see ourselves as, um, I, I, I guess, part of this, capitalist like overarching like narrative like we have to work our way up and you know put your uh, pull your bootstraps on or whatever the expression is and work your way up and you'll get there and you'll get the money and you'll be and it really isn't the case and the fact that there is no unionization for fighters there's been attempts but there's no you know nothing's going on in terms of making that well people are trying I shouldn't say nothing's going on in terms of making it a reality but it's far from reality that there's going to be equal representation for any kind of fighter financially for any kind of equity um, across the board and that's that's really difficult so you're you're absolutely right and I do love that in the arc of the book you know you're definitely giving credit to people pushing through those barriers but it's it's not just enough to shatter the glass ceiling you have mm -hmm. to clear the glass you have to get it out of the way you have to get to the next level so you know it's it that's one aspect of it but you know it's time we the the thing is that because fighters are inclined to only think of themselves it's a really easy system to you, mean, you have to think of yourself you're fighting in a cage by yourself right when I mean, you have a team behind you if this and that but at the end of the day it's you fighting in a cage against another human being and so you don't 
like you want to please or you want to follow everything that's going to get you to the point where you are on top tactically, strategically, everything, you know, in terms of your career um, makes you the person that's going to get the most money. You're going to get the victory. You're going to be better than everybody else. And that's really easy to exploit. And it is very much exploited. And, you know, the... I think, you know, I'm not an expert in labor practices, but I think you really hit the nail on the head in a lot of ways in calling out, you know, what's an exploitive system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I really liked your metaphor that you used there. You don't have to only break the glass ceiling. You have to clear the glass because if you don't clear the glass, you're going to get cut as you move up. So it's a great metaphor. And I would say, you know, there's something... in the, the chapter, there's one in the chapter that I talk about the American dream and how well it maps on to this narrative of what it's like to be a fighter. Because the American dream myth is, is you have, you face adversity in life, you work really hard, you overcome obstacles, and then you succeed. Mm-hmm. And what we know of boxing narratives, whether it's film or, you know, other types of, you know, literature it often maps onto this idea that you have somebody who is starting from a lower socioeconomic class. It's the Rocky that's, you know, goes through all of this adversity. And it really does play out in terms of UFC fighters, that narrative of adversity in the cage. They talk about a lot of times that, you know, a fighter has a loss and they learn from that loss. And that's part of the journey to overcome whatever obstacle to get to whatever echelon that they want to get to. But it also, at the same time, there's this other narrative that's happening. The fact that, you know, it's hard and you're not getting paid very well and that you have to work your tail off just to get to the next level or to get the next fight is all part of the narrative that's woven by this this organization that it's not only hard, the actual fighting in, in the cage part, it's hard because you might be, you might be ha- struggling to make ends meet. And that is part of the adversity that you need to overcome. And what I talk about in the book is oftentimes that narrative isn't extended to women. And it is in the UFC. And that a lot of women, the the stories that that they're telling about female fighters map onto this, this myth discourse. And they're doing it in ways with fighters that we don't often see that aren't as visible. So, you know, I talk about Jessica Andrade in this narrative who's an, you know, out lesbian fighter. I talk about Nunes. I talk about Nico Montano, who's a native fighter. And she gets celebrated for being branded as this first native UFC champion. And yet what I show in the book is she goes through all of this adversity and she keeps, you know, saying, okay, I just have to overcome. I just have to overcome. And so there's a way that it's like, yes, we have the first, we have this representation, you know, not only do we have women, but we have a native woman. And then you have a native woman that had a very difficult weight cut because of some structural issues within the UFC and then has to, you know, go two years without fighting, um, which is very challenging financially. So this is all part of, of, of kind of some of the things that, that we talk about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would, say, I would add it's challenging financially. It's also challenging psychologically because a fighter fights. A fighter wants to fight. When you're at the highest level and you're a champion, you have more to protect. And so you probably fight less um, because, you know, protecting that championship your, your purse is bigger, right? So it can, it can last longer and it's also, it's more meaningful. I don't know, quote unquote meaningful when you fight because if you lose your championship, you lose everything, right? Well, she was stripped of her championship because she couldn't fight. And then, you know, psychologically, I think, and I don't know Nico Montano. Um, I think we've met, I know her manager pretty well. Um, I think we've met before, but not, I've, I, we've never trained before and I've never really had an extended conversation with her, but you know, what I can insert from my own experiences of having extended periods of not fighting is that it's, it's frustrating. It's when, when you kind of slow that velocity, it, it, it makes a lot of other things in your life, which you can put on hold, it makes them much more present and much more difficult to deal with. 
And so, you know, I, I feel for her. And then at the same time being used, I don't know if tokenism is the right word, but being used as kind of, oh, this is, look at this, we're going to celebrate, which is absolutely, we should be celebrating, you know, the first um, Native champion. Absolutely, we should be celebrating the first Black champion, the first Asian, you know, the, all of these things should be celebrated because representation, right, it, it is super important. But it's not just about, it's representation, it's surfaces and essences, right? I mean, it's, it's the surface of what we've created, like, you know, okay, this is great, look at this beautiful thing that we can say, but the essence behind it also has to support it. Mm -hmm. And um, that's not always the case, I think. Mm -hmm. So one of the other things that I talk about in the book is, is like how this discourse of representation matters feels so good. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to play an ad that Digital Domain um, created for the UFC. It's a trailer for the, the Rousey home fight back in 2015, I think. And it really kind of hits the emotional essence of, of culturally why we think representation is so important. So I'm gonna play it and then we can talk about how it feels. All right. So this is uh, an ad that I analyze in the book. And I'm curious, I don't know if you've seen that recently, Julie, um, but what are your thoughts on it? Uh, it's, I mean, it, it, it's funny. It's funny not to have a personal reaction to it. I love the swell of the music. You know, I love the inspiration. It's hard not to feel like, um, wanting to start punching things when you see something like that as a former fighter it's like when you hear baba o'reilly's like teenage wasteland if you've ever been to a live ufc fight and yeah. you start training you hear that you just go nuts because that's like one of those it's just it's a triggering kind of thing um i i think it's very it's interesting i really like the way they played on emotional tropes in that. Um, I think that uh, that was actually Rousey's younger sister. Mm -hmm. I think young Holly Holm looked nothing like Holly Holm. <laughs> Having trained with her and known her, I just didn't think it looked like <laughs> her. But um, <laughs> she's a very beautiful woman, very like, you know, well done, good job getting kind of, you know, what, you know, what she was about, what the, the story. I think there's a really beautiful narrative being played out there. I also think that um, it's very white, but mm -hmm. that fight was very white. I, and there's, I, that's not a critique against the fighters involved in it. That just mm -hmm. happens to be, you know, uh, mm -hmm. how it's, uh, how it was. Um, one would hope for more in the future. Yeah. Well, and, and there's a few things there that, that I talk about. So, so this is obviously very high production value. And so they spend the most money on fighters who look like that, mm -hmm. which is, you know, part of how they market get female fighters and you see representations of you know I compare it actually to a video of uh, Jessica Andrade who's a Brazilian lesbian fighter she presents more masculinely than these these two women and I talk about how there's hierarchies in that visibility in terms of with the capacity to have digital media we can create stories that really kind of follow somebody like Andrade but it's not the high production value that this is because this is this clearly caught a lot of more or costs a lot more money and then on top of that you see these other things that I've been pulling out that this idea of girls and women's empowerment is really hot right now like in advertising like any Nike ad you you watch with women in it it has a similar emotional uh, register in terms of female athletes and then there is notice that there is gender inequality there that you can see that you know how these women are getting judged as they're coming up through the ranks uh, so gender inequality exists in this framework, which is really interesting for advertising. And then also the American dream, because you see that, you know, that despite of all the adversity, you know, they succeed in the win in the end and they, they come together in this fight. And so, you know, what I talk about is, is how good that feels. And, you know, when I first, when I first watched this, I mean, as, you know, 15 years in, in amateur martial arts, I cried because I, you know, I experienced, you know, as a woman in martial arts, you know, I've experienced things that are similar as a white woman. Um, you know, I, I come from a particular brand of femininity that caters to those, like, those particular identities. And that's what gets represented as, you know, representing women for the sport. So, um, 
But so that is, you know, the glittering piece, the, the part that makes us feel good, the part that says that, hey, the UFC has broken barriers, and, and they play that narrative a lot. But now I want to switch over to the second part of the book, which is really the heart of that is thinking about labor issues. And so I want to talk about this issue of independent contractors and what that actually means. So all UFC fighters are independently contracted. So that means a lot of different things in terms of, you know, when they get paid, how much they get paid. Um, that means things in terms of health insurance. Um, and so I thought we would talk about what, what do fighters have to pay for themselves in order to fight in UFC because they are independent contractors. So they don't have, you know, they don't have trainers that the UFC is paying for like other sports. They don't have facilities that the UFC pays for. They don't have doctors that the UFC pays for unless it's, you know, at, at a fight. So could you talk a little bit about what all, what did you, what did you have to pay out of your own pocket? Well, um, I mean, it, it's kind of an interesting, I mean, again, it was a while ago when I fought in the UFC. I always want to have that disclaimer um, in that I don't want to get any unfair criticism put on you or the book or anything that I'm saying. So that disclaimer out there, it was a long time. Um, I, I paid my coaches, some of my coaches I was very close to and they ripped up my checks. So I was lucky in that uh, respect, but I still had to pay a percentage to managers. Um, medicals, you could, there were ways to get around um, paying full price for medicals, um, like for MCAT or sorry, not MCATs, sorry, for, <laughs> for CAT scans and MRIs, uh, you know, you, you had to pay for that out of pocket, but a lot of that you could enroll in a Cleveland clinic study or something, you know, to the extent, so you could mitigate some of those costs. But at the end of the day, you are paying for blood work, you're paying for this, you're, you know, you're paying to make sure that you are, um, you're healthy enough to fight, that, you know, a commissioned body is going to sanction you to fight. And, that is quite a lot of money and it can be quite a lot of money, especially when you're first starting out. Now, I know the UFC establishes performance training center in Nevada where fighters can go to train and, and they have specialists helping them with weight cuts and stuff. But I think getting to that performance institute, I think you have to pay for that yourself to get there. I don't yeah. know if you pay while you're there or not. I've not talked to anybody about that. I but that kind of, there, but you have to pay to get there. Uh, travel is expensive, like really uh -huh. expensive for a fighter. Eating is expensive. Housing is expensive. You know, these are the things you don't actually want to be thinking about as a fighter either. And they're the most expensive. I mean, you need to be eating certain healthy, organic, uh, sodium, low sodium, high protein foods um, as much as possible to make sure that it's fueling your body to perform on a certain level. That's expensive food. That is not cheap. Um, you, massage therapy is incredibly important um, to athletes. Some athletes believe in chiropractors or, you know, or uh, is it orth orthopedic seems like the wrong word. I'm so sorry. I'm a little fried today. <laughs> yeah, but you just, you, you need doctors to help you stay in shape. I, I would say a lot of fighters fight injured because there is no real insurance. There's insurance to cover injuries in a fight. I think there's a certain amount of insurance. If you get injured training for a fight, you get taken care of, but that's, that has not always been the case. Um, that's actually fairly new as mm -hmm. far as I know. And there's also there's this kind of, I, I always talk about the mental and the psychological cost of it, but it's true. If, if you have, if you pull out of a fight, let's say, um, well, referencing Amanda Nunes had a sinus infection while she was champion and she had to have no surgery. So she pulled out of fights and then Dana White was speaking poorly of her at that time. That can affect sponsorship money. That can affect, you know, your endorsements, your uh, capacity to make money while you can't fight is, you know, it, it's kind of based on that sort of thing. I mean, fighters can have jobs outside of, you know, fighting professionally, but it's a hard life. I mean, it's really hard to have a job outside of fighting, particularly because they're enrolled in the, the anti-doping agency protocols so that, you know, you have to tell these people where you are at all times so they can come drug test you randomly. And, you know, if you're at work, and you forgot to tell them you were at work someday or they can't find you, then that's a failed test. So there's a lot of things that work against you. So the expense and the cost of getting ready for a fight, um, ballpark, I'd say it's 70% of your purse. Mm 
Mm -hmm. for a lower range fighter yeah I, i'd say 60 to 70 percent of your purse for you know uh, an entry-level fighter and that's a really important thing for folks to understand because sometimes like you see in certain states they have to disclose how much the ufc is paying fighters so nevada for example you have to disclose because the athletic commission say that you you have to you have to state that and so for example a a fighter that's kind of a no-name fighter that's just starting out in, in the UFC will get $12,000 to show up to a fight and $12,000 if they win. That's a very sort of baseline first contract kind of sum. And they get a little bit of money from Reebok for, for wearing Reebok apparel. And Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. Plus the Reebok deals. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Venom is Venom's gonna yeah. do that. But so if you think about that, so you're like, oh, okay, you fight once and you get $24,000, that's not so bad. But all the things that you've listed that you have to pay for out of pocket, that is, that's really the crux of it in that, and because the UFC is, is the UFC and doesn't really have another competitor, there's, there's very little incentive for them to pay more. And if you start adding up the averages of the disclosed pay, and, and this is very difficult to do because the, and I make this very clear in the book that because the UFC is not publicly traded yet, I heard today, they may be soon, but they're not publicly traded yet. So nobody has access to their ledger. So we can't really say this is the percentage, but estimates are somewhere around, you know, 10 to 20% of, of their overall revenue goes towards fighters, which is pretty low when you compare it to other types of sports organizations, like, you know, ones that have unions have, you know, something like 50%, you know, share goes to, goes to the players. And the UFC argues that they have more cost overhead because they do a lot of the media themselves, yada, yada, yada. But the issue is that we don't really know and fighters don't really know because they don't have access to that information. And that's one of the things that I really argue for in the book is that, you know, okay, the USC says, yeah, we actually give the fighters, you know, what we can, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, obviously there's no way to prove that because they don't, they don't have to. And so pay is, is one of those issues that I talk a lot about. And, and from what you can tell from the publicly disclosed pay, which doesn't account for everything and is only a snapshot you know, gender inequality exists in terms of, you know, how much they're paying female fighters, especially if you take Ronda Rousey out of the equation, because they like to say, oh, you can make as much as, you know, as the men make, because look, Ronda Rousey did it, but you don't look at, look at any other female fighter and you can't really make that argument, especially for, you know, fighters that are either in the mid range in terms of how visible they are or how much they're winning fights to the lower range they're really not making very much money at all. And they're, you know, just, they're in that hamster wheel trying to, you know, achieve that dream. And it's, um, you know, it's an, it's an issue that I really take them to task for because I think that there, there needs to be a lot of improvement in terms of the agency that the fighters have to make decisions for themselves and then also pay issues and, you know, being able to, to really advocate for themselves. Absolutely. And I think there's also a very capricious application of backstage bonuses, which again, it kind of reinforces that capitalist, um, please the boss. And, you know, you might, you might get that million dollar bonus or you might get that, you know, that brand new car. Um, and that's not that, you know, as much as it might be put out there, that is not accessible across the board. Mm -hmm. uh, there, you know, the, uh, we don't know how much those backdoor bonuses are. We don't know how much some people are getting or, you know, it, it, what their relationship with the, I guess, you know, I don't want to just say Dana White because I understand, you know, it's a different promotional endeavor, it's a different promotional team than, than Zufa. But at the end of the day, I think capricious is the right word for how the money is is applied, even though maybe a male and female fighter will start at 12 and 12, um, as a you know a starting fighter you don't know what another fighter is going to be getting and so you don't know what you need to sacrifice or what you need to do in order to be making more money when it should just be your salary mm -hmm. right you're doing a job and I, I understand it's a performance-based salary but when you think about you going to a fight if you're fighting for 12 and 12 you know that that initial 12,000 is 
also dependent on your opponent showing up, making weight, being the same opponent, you know, a, a whole bunch of other factors. There's nothing written in there saying you still get that $12,000 if your opponent doesn't show or if you, you know, have trained and get injured. So. Yeah, and I talk about that in the book too, because you know some fighters voice some real concern around that because you you hear that your that your opponent might pull out. That means that you've invested all this time in your training camp leading up to. You've invested money to get your team to the event. You've invested, you know, your time and you know you're depending on that paycheck. And you show up and your opponent doesn't for whatever reason or can't fight. Then certain states require that they still be paid but other states don't have that same requirement. So it's really stressful because then you're, you're very expendable. And so um, before we run out of time and, and go to the q and I wanna talk about this issue of unionization because my last chapter looks at, focuses on Leslie Smith, who is a fighter that was really advocating for unionization through, through an organization called Project Spearhead. And she worked with Kajan Johnson, who was another UFC fighter, and Lucas Middlebrook, who was Leslie's attorney, um, to, to create a, to attempt to create a union. And part of what they were really advocating for is transparency so that, mm -hmm. that you know, UFC fighters had more investment and more understanding of, of how the business actually worked so that they can then say, okay, you have to give us a greater share of the pie because... This is unfair that your your business is completely dependent on fighters. If you don't have fighters, you don't have the UFC. And yet the fighters are the ones that are not necessarily making the money unless you're a superstar. And so, and that's where the UFC kind of focuses. If you're a superstar, then you can make a, a decent amount of money, but the rest of the people on the roster aren't. Um, and then there's also, you know, issues that they, they really want to advocate for in terms of you know, getting fighters health insurance because fighting is so hard on the body and we're learning more and more about CTE and issues of, you know, concussions and knockout in the UFC. I mean, it's people get concussed all the time. And so, you know, part of, part of that is taking care of people because of their long-term health. And even, you know, even the NFL, we know there's a concussion crisis there. They have certain stipulations that their unions advocated for so that they could take care of their players later on. Now they're not doing enough. And of course we get critique the NFL, but there's no, you know, you don't get retirement benefits for the UFC and you don't get any long-term health benefits. And so that is, is something that, you know, a union could, could work to, to force the issue. Yeah. And I think one of the great things you pointed out in your book is the, I mean, it takes a lot of courage to fight in a cage, but it also takes a lot of courage as Leslie Smith has to go up there and ask a question, like mm -hmm. straight up there and ask about unionization in front of all of her peers, in front of, you know, in front of her bosses and just be like, you know, hello, like, you know, what, what is going to happen here? Like what, what were the benefits of, of unionization? And I, I, I don't know. I just, I really think she's been a fierce advocate for, for equality in the sport. And I think a lot of that <laughs> had to factor into her, them not renewing her contract, right, with the UFC, like, you know, getting rid of one of the louder voices saying, hey, we need this, um, we need to question these practices, and mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's one of the things that, that I cover is that, you know, they didn't renew her contract, and even if she, you know, even fighters that have contracts, the way the contracts operate is the UFC can, can end that contract at any point, or they can, you know, shelf a fighter and leave, not give them a fight, but they're still under contract, which means the fighter can't work for another organization, which I know a lot of fighters are fearful about. Um, so, you know, I think unionization is one of, you know, the clear path forward that I see that I advocate for in the book, you know, based on conversations with, with those three people that I mentioned, Leslie included, and then also just looking into the literature that, that shows that women and people of color are the people that benefit the most from unionization. And that's how I frame it within the context of the book that focuses on women is that the women, if they are underpaid, then what unions do is help to bring about more of parity in terms of how pay, the pay structure operates so that you make sure that the people that are often left out of, of those types of negotiations or the people that, that don't get as much when they negotiate 
then then it, there's some assurances there. And so that's one of the things that I that I really argue for. Which is and I mean and based on that argument, but just it, the people that benefit the most are the ones are that are also again I don't I, I'm using the word tokenism and I think it might be an inappropriate word or an offensive word and I don't mean it but it's you know when you think about is saying this is the first of this and we're going to benefit you know promoting the first of this and the first of this but you know the first is usually the person who's the most you know represents a group that is underrepresented you know mm -hmm. and so like it, it, it seems as though there's something fairly exploitive in that mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, you know and, as you're saying like if if there's not unionization and there's no or there's not you know a method in place in order to promote equality across the board especially for the people who generally benefit the most from unionization it seems a little unfair that a promotion would benefit from those people who are yeah not yeah yeah no that's i mean that's an excellent point it's it yeah it, and, and that's really you know the crux of it that i'm trying to get at i think is that you know if you're if you're gaining all of this from the diversity that you're representing mm -hmm. and yet the people that are that are making the least amount of pay and have the least access to decision making are also those same people then clearly there's a huge disconnect between what it looks like on the surface and then actually what's happening underneath and, and what's actually going on. Mm -hmm. I could keep talking to you for hours <laughs> and I've talked to you <laughs> previously. You were, you were one of the interviewees for my book and offered <laughs> immense insight and I appreciate that. Um, but let's go ahead, Vicki, if you want to go ahead and, and start opening up, um, I think it's time for Q&A. Yes, we have... Um several really interesting questions um, already percolating, uh, one of which actually directly relates to this last point that you were just talking about, about unionization. Um, and you addressed that, um, but the one of the questions that's sort of not yet addressed is, do you think a fighter's union is actually possible in the near mm. future? Um, and I wonder too, Jen, if your discussion in the book about the sort of uh, corporate, per the purchasing, you know, endeavor in the family, and then this possibility of going public, um, is, do you think that that will force the issue uh, a bit more because there might be states in which, you know, the incorporation yeah. would require such representation? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's really, like, going public is, is, is really interesting because suddenly that will make leisures visible. And I think that a lot of people could start analyzing exactly how, how this business is operating and probably provide some decent suggestions for how things might be improved for the fighters. It's still, I mean, that said, we are still in a neoliberal capitalist society that privileges corporations over individuals and privileges corporations over workers. And so it will, it will be a fight, um, but it will be an informed fight that I hope that, you know, I hope people will join. So I talk about some of the barriers to unionization for UFC fighters. Um, and this is largely informed by people like, like Lucas and, and Leslie who, who've talked about, you know, their experience trying to unionize. So there's a fear of retaliation because contractors, because UFC fighters are contracted and they don't have guarantees in their contract that they'll keep their jobs. And a lot of people are fearful and other fighters I've talked to as well. And a lot of people just don't want to have that conversation like with me because they don't, they're afraid that it might get out there in the world that, that they've talked about these issues. And so that's a big barrier, you know, if they're afraid because it is a very individualized sport. So you're kind of trying to keep your head down and just, just do your job and you don't really want to get into the politics of it. And, but that is, that's really conducive for not changing anything. Um, and then also another thing that, that Project Spearhead, those folks were talking about is how difficult it is because you never bring all the fighters together at one time. So you look at other, you know, other sports and you have, you know, teams that are together all the time and they're talking about issues and they have, you know, their unions representing them within their sports. And you have other people coming together at various times where they can, they can talk about these issues. The UFC several years ago 
you know, had a, a fighter summit and this, this issue was raised there. And this is when Leslie Smith first stood up and said, Hey, what's going on? Like we need to unionize. And, you know, there was a, you know, people got really excited around the room, but then they haven't had another event like that since, because I think if you actually got the fighters together where they felt like they had a little bit more power um, and they realized that other people had similar experiences, maybe, maybe that there would be more impetus for change. So there's, I mean, and there's several other things that I talk about in that particular chapter that are, you know, because they're so geographically dispersed all around the world. You know, we're not just talking about fighters that live in the States either. We're talking about people that are, you know, all over the place. Yeah. Um, and so relating, uh, so Julie, I know you're working on a memoir um, and also a question was raised in the chat about Jen, your own, uh, autobiography in terms of your own experience as a fighter. Um, and so the question was whether in writing the book, um, and maybe Julie, in thinking about your own writing, how did you, how did your own years of experience in martial arts inform your research and writing process? And here, Jen, I'm thinking of the wondrous meditation on love that concludes the book, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is just exquisite. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's talk about that because I, I didn't get to that and I wanted to talk to Julie about that too, but Julie, why don't you go ahead and answer that question first? Oh, well, uh, you know, I, I guess I've been in martial arts my entire life. And so um, I think one of the unfortunate things about my writing process is that I've really learned how to be lazy about it uh, and how that informs it and how like you like to I mean when because when you're disciplined in a sport you're disciplined you're disciplined in an art you know you show up you put your gi on or you, you show up to the gym you put your gloves on you do the work um, and then in the off time you just you're exhausted and so you don't do anything. And so my ability to write for extended periods of time when I'm in the zone is fantastic and I love it. My ability to avoid writing, I think is very much informed by my martial arts and fighting experience. I hate to say that because it's all discipline and all this, but uh, you know, on the other hand, if you, there's a, I am, um, I love writing, I loved fighting. I have found that I cannot write unless I'm involved with fighting to some extent. So unless I have a fight show, you know, there's an Invicta coming up, I become a better writer when there's an Invicta coming up. Um, I was a better writer in Iowa, partially because of the pressure of the program and partially because I was teaching out of a boxing gym. And so when I can physically be involved in martial arts, it does inform my writing. I think there's a physicality to writing. Um, that being said, the, the pandemic has had a huge, horrible effect on my writing, <laughs> coupled with my own tendency toward laziness. So I think Jen should take this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so there's an interesting thing that happens sometimes in, well, it happened when I first started, um, when I first started writing the dissertation, I was also starting fairly new in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I'd been training other martial arts, but fairly new in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And when I first started that, I had this total, you know, when you're a beginner at something and you, there's a, a freedom there because you have no pressure on you because you just kind of flow. In jiu-jitsu, like that's, that's very much, you just kind of like, you're, you're bouncing off of somebody else's body, literally and you don't know what's going to happen next and, you, and you're kind of just trying things out and sometimes they, they work and sometimes they don't and I realized at that point that my writing was very stunted because I was way too in my head and I thought it had to be way too perfect and so I actually thought in order to make my writing better I needed to let go of that that sort of need to be perfect at it and I needed to just flow and that really kind of opened up writing for me in a lot of ways um, because it was, you know, the, the martial arts metaphor really matched really well onto my writing. And I think, so the last, the, the conclusion is called on, on Love and Violence. And it's an attempt to address, like, I always get this question, oh, so UFC is so violent, you know, yada, yada, yada. Why do people do this? And you know, I kind of like turn it on its head and, and try to think about, okay, so why do fighters, so they, they have this love of the sport and love of fighting and they really want to do it. And so they put up with, with, you know, 
they put up with really kind of poor working conditions in order to be able to do this job that they love. And I argued that the real violence is the sort of lack of consent around the you know, ability to sort of break a contract at, at a moment's notice if they want, because the difference between the sport that you know, has violent elements um, and you know, actual real world violence is consent because there are rules in the sports, there's rules of engagement and you literally do, you know, while there's you know, certainly bad blood in MMA and certainly people that don't like each other, there's also a lot of respect for each other as competitors and even love. And when that gets violated by an organization that is you know, exploiting its fighters, then that is the real violence. And that's kind of what you know, I end up arguing in the book that, that we need to think about how organizations are violent as opposed to sort of this act of MMA being the violence that we're concerned with. Yeah, and I would like to add to that um, as somebody who loves fighting and as somebody who I spend a lot of time thinking, writing, and, and studying violence. Um, there's so many things that violence encompasses. And so on. I think you're absolutely hitting the nail on the head when it comes to consent and violence. I was thinking, just as you were speaking about, you know, why do people climb Everest? They know mm -hmm. freezing, they know they could fall, they know they could die, you know, it's, but it's the, it's, it's the climb it's the pushing your body, it's doing something, committing wholly to something that you know is a risk, but you know that the payoff is in the pursuit. And so I would, I have no analogy when it comes to the violence surrounding ever, I mean, besides, you know, the physical conditions, but I guess the bureaucracy or the consent ideas, or I don't know anything about climbing, but I do think that that, that pursuit of the pursuit is what makes MMA so wonderful, what makes combat sports violence so wonderful and so addictive and, you know, the path that some people actually really need to take. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, somewhat related, I think, to this theme of the question of violence, um, but also I think, um, well, there are a couple questions related to the issue of gender and representation in terms of a sport that is often perceived of as inherently violent. Um, and one of those questions was raised by um, your showing of the, the Every Revolution Starts With a Fight video, Jen, um, around this notion that uh, especially youthful female uh, uh, aggression is read as a kind of like um, problem. Uh, or behavioral issue as opposed to it being coded as totally normal for boys, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that this, yeah, <clears throat> and there was another comment about the ways in which, I mean, I think these are related, when a female fighter reaches a kind of pinnacle of success, she is often compared in commentary discourse to a male star. Right, so that there's this kind of weird sort of struggle where on the one hand, enter, in entering into the sport, it's considered inappropriately masculine uh, in, in like marketing culture or what have you. And, uh, but at reaching this height of success in the sport, you're analogized to the masculine. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sort of mashing up a couple folks' questions there and I hope it makes sense, but I was wondering if you would wanna comment on, on any of that. Um, particularly, I think Jen, as it relates to your your further study about if she can see it, she can be it, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, in what ways is channeling uh, aggression a seen as a positive and empowering kind of thing? Yeah. And in what ways is it read as a kind of uh, going against gender norms somehow? Yeah, I mean, there's a few things, a lot of things that we could talk about in those questions. Um, one, it is still a male-dominated sport. And so there are you know, I, I, I tend to focus on, in the book, I, talk, I focus on the quote unquote positive representations because I wanna, I wanna take us to a place where even if, even if they're doing the, the things right, there's, there's still issues we gotta talk about that are beyond representation. But that's not to say that they're really perfect at representation because they, they, mess, <laughs> they mess that up all the time in a variety of ways with a variety of different types of identities. So that's something I need to be clear about. Um, but I also think that the issue of, I, I resist as a woman who's been in martial arts 
you know, for a while, I resist the idea that aggression or physical physicality and fighting is male. I'm uncomfortable with that because it's, when I do it, it's not male, <laughs> you know? And I, I understand why culturally it's coded that way. And of course, um, and of course we as women have, you know, especially certain identities, particularly white women are, are really pushed away from, from that because we're, you know, there's all this discourse of protection and, you know, what it's, you know, what it's meant to be a lady and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then women of color get, get compared against that standard of, of, of femininity. But ultimately, you know, in my bones, like it doesn't, it doesn't read as, as masculine. Yeah. And I don't mean to put words into no, the no, questioner's course. mouth. What I, what I would point of out course. is like what your book does really well is actually break down what's going on in that promotional advertisement in terms of tapping into these received codes. So yeah. for instance, the, the sideways look that she gets when bruised, when sitting in the pew, right? Yeah. You know, like in the context of church, oh, she must have been abused or what have you. That those are all like just plugging into very conventionalized mm -hmm. understandings of whiteness, femininity, mm -hmm. and questions of who, who can be beaten and who can lay down beatings, um, which I think you do a really great job of, of understanding the, the power of that in that video yeah. Um, as well. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's definitely a great point. I think that's part of it. Do we have time for one more question? I think so. They're all so good. Um, there was a question about asking if you could talk a bit more about the politics in the politics of representation for female fighters. And I think we've talked a bit about that, but part of it too, in relation to the relative conservatism of say UFC, as opposed to say an entity like WNBA. So um, if I'm understanding, so the part- Mostly just the notion of the politics in the politics of representation for the female fighters themselves. Mm -hmm. So I actually, I talk about, so a politics of visibility, that term itself is common in, in academic discourse and popular culture. It's this idea that if representation exists, it means that you have some sort of cultural clout and power. And that's what we've been operating under for a long period of time is this idea that that can give us access to certain things in, in, in society. So identities that have been underrepresented, if they are represented, then they have more cultural clout. Uh, Sarah Bene Weiser talks about this idea of, of economies of visibility where, where those ideas get incorporated into this, this marketplace where you can sell identities and you can sell representation and it doesn't mean that those representations actually have given people any sort of power. They're just now, they, they just have greater visibility. And embedded in that within the UFC in particular, they are representing a lot of diversity and the way that they conceive of diversity is different market niche. So you can have a, hey, we have the first L LGBTQ champion. And then, hey, we have this other fighter, Colby Covington, who, really is racist and sexist and, and caters to an alt-right masculine type of identity group. And they'll market both of those at the same time because they represent different demographics of their market. And so their conception, the politics of it is, is not necessarily advancing like fighting against inequality in terms of having diversity or representation, but increasing their market share. And so that means that we can cater to an alt-right audience and we can cater to you know, an audience that wants to watch, you know, empowered female fighters fight. And, and that's the interesting thing, I think, about the way that they market difference in particular. I think we are running out of time now. Well, do you all have any final, final thoughts to pass on as we close out? Really, anything on luminosity? I would just have to say, I, this is I. I really I thank you for writing this book. Um, I know there's a lot in there that you didn't even get 
get to cover. So I hope there's a sequel. But um, I, I, I really think it's an important um, book. And I think it examines MMA and also brings MMA discourse to a academic level, which, you know, we don't, we don't get enough of that. And so I think you did a beautiful job of bridging, you know, the violence, the love and the actual important issues that really need to be brought to the surface and in, in to a new audience, to an academic audience, which really needs to pay attention. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. I do want to just put up my thank yous <laughs> just for a second so I don't forget, but thank you all the people that are on here that, that helped me make this book possible or helped make this book possible. Um, I had a huge, wonderful team of people over the past seven, seven years that I have invested a lot in me. And so I just want to thank all the people that are on this list. Um, and also thank you everyone who, who came today um, and, and listened and, and asked questions. And I just really appreciate all your support and I hope you, hope you read the book. <laughs> thank you. Happy everyone. birthday, Julie. Oh, thank oh and you. happy birthday, Julie. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> all right, thanks everyone. Thanks for including me, Jeb. Yeah, thank you so much, Vicki. I really appreciate it.